This episode is in partnership with Authority Magazine. Authority Magazine, a medium publication, is devoted to sharing in-depth and interesting interviews featuring people who are authorities in business, pop culture, wellness, social impact, and tech. There was a time when the names Chico, Harpo, Groucho, and Zeppo ruled the world of comedy. In fact, the Marx Brothers remain icons to this day, perhaps especially Groucho and his one-liners. And the spirit of Groucho lives on in the persona of Frank Ferrante, who has portrayed Groucho thousands of times. In fact, he also has the ownership of Groucho Marx Productions, which represents the name and likeness of the iconic performer himself. Frank, welcome to Believe in People. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut right to the chase because I think this is so cool. You were discovered by Groucho Marx's son, playwright Arthur Marx. Two questions for you. How did that happen? And um, did you think it would change your life forever? Well, I had no idea. I, I, I was a lifelong fan of comedy, lifelong. I was 22 when I did the show in college. But from the time I was a boy, 10 years old, I loved humor and comedy and comedy films. I loved the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and Three Stooges, et cetera. You know, so the comedies that were being shown on television in the 70s. And as a student at the University of Southern California, I put on a one man show as a senior project on Groucho Marx, An Evening with Groucho. And I performed it to my last week's as a senior at USC. And I, I invited Groucho's family to see the show, Groucho's daughter, Miriam. I invited Groucho's grandson, Andy Marx, uh, and Arthur Marx, who, who you reference. Arthur is a playwright, was a playwright, he's, he's since uh, deceased, but he, he was a writer and had a play about his father that had been tooling around the country and Canada. And they showed up. Arthur showed up. Miriam showed up. Andy showed up. Maury Riskin, who co-wrote Marx Brothers classic films like Animal Crackers, Night at the Opera. He was 89. He was in the audience. <laughs> and it was a, it was horrifying and exhilarating. And I pulled it off. I was nervous and nauseous before I went on. But the show went well. People stood up at the end. And Arthur Marx said to me, if I ever do a show about my father again, I'd like to use you. And I thought, oh yeah, right. But also, I didn't sleep for three days. I was so thrilled by the by the mere thought that this could be possible. And within within weeks, he offered me a role, the role of, of his father, from age fifteen to eighty five, in a show called Groucho. And that show started as a dinner theater show with me, my first equity job, professional job. And the gentleman that owned this dinner theater wanted to produce in New York. So within a year of the Kansas City production and dinner theater, I was in New York off Broadway. So a year and a half after I graduate, I'm in New York. I'm 23. That show plays for a year. And then it moves to London and receives wonderful reviews and awards. A great deal of affirmation was had. So it all came out of my love of, of humor and laughing at the Marx Brothers. And to answer your question, I had no idea that the traje trajectory would 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 be as it was. And it was a thrill. And it really became, it opened a lot many doors for me in terms of being a creative person in the theater. And that, that was 40, almost 40 years ago. What is it or was it about that style of humor that attracted you? You're saying that this sort of, uh, you were watching this sort of stuff in the, in the 70s, but this wasn't 70s humor and uh it, i mean it's it's kind of slapstick but there's uh -huh. a lot of wit in it the writing is very succinct it's very witty it's very smart what is it about that that attracted you and why don't we have humor like that anymore well what i was i was a pretty shy kid like most kids and i love the irreverence the boldness and the brashness of the marx brothers Groucho was an insult comic within the within the vehicles that that he performed within, and I loved that they were wild and free, and I wanted to treat the nuns who taught me in third grade 
the way he treated Margaret Dumont, the society matron in all those movies. And to <laughs> me, it was exhilarating. I mean, to me, I gut laughed for the first time looking at a screen. Uh, but you're right about the wit. Some of the jokes I didn't get or the references. And as I got older and continued to watch and study and be exposed to more humor, I, I got it. And every it was always an aha moment. And it was, ex, you know, just again, I keep using the word exhilarating because that's what it was. And that's always my goal when I perform, whether it's this role or other interactive comedy roles. I do different roles. I, my job is to exhilarate, to shock, surprise, make people think or um I think the comedy of the 70s, I think, actually was influenced quite a bit by the Marx Brothers, people like Woody Allen and Mel Brooks, Peter Sellers. So I think that their descendants of the Marx Brothers, I think there's a lot of, I mean, there's so much. There was a period where before, you know, cable and the Internet where you go, where is the where are the funny movies? There's so much funny now that you that in, in I see. Uh, on Netflix and Hulu, and it's just a, it's a plethora of incredible shows, and funny show, and great character driven comedy. Um, but to your point, nothing is quite over the top and lasting as, say, the Marx Brothers or Chaplin or Laurel Hardy or W.C. Fields, where they have these very distinguished traits and persona. Um, I don't know, I, I, you know, there are, you know, there's Pee Wee Herman. You know, who you know is no longer with us. There was Dame Edna, who are these outrageous characters mm -hmm. that made you really laugh hard. And a comedy, you know, like everything, everything changes and morphs and becomes reflective and reaction, you know, re, re, you know, to it's reflective of the times and also a reaction to the times. I think the kind of comedy that we're re receiving, the experience you're being exposed to. But I'm proud that I can that the that I'm affiliated with this type of humor, this brash humor, because I love playing all over the world and seeing young people respond to it. They don't even have to know who he is, this character. But I do something that's called crowd work. I didn't even know it was called crowd work until critics around the country started saying, he's, you know, he's, he's terrific at doing crowd work, which is kind of what Don Rickles did, but, but, but different. I really go in and I went through the crowd, whether it says Groucho, I work in the Cirque, the Cirque du Soleil type shows where I'm a host. And I do a lot of audience work. I bring people on stage. And immersive theater has become quite popular. Interactive theater in the last 15, 20 years has become popular. Um, and I've always, I've been part of that for the last 20 years. But it's all related to vaudeville and having to do whatever it takes to survive, quite frankly, to engage an audience. That's a lot that of work, Frank. I mean, you think that's really smart comedy. I mean, you that's a lot of work to be able to have that wit and that quickness to be able to pick up on the audience. You're reading, like, I mean, you're doing all these things simultaneously. So you've mentioned you were a shy kid, but, um, and yet what were you like as a kid? Like, were you doing, were you the funny guy? Like, what, what, what were you like? I may have been in the back row making little wisecracks, you know, but height, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to get slapped by, by Sister Rosaria. But, um, you know, I liked, I was doing little things back then, doing sketches. And in high school, I was doing the morning announcements, which turned into like a comedy radio show. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, it was supposed to be like three minutes. They'd go and turn it to 20 minute routines. You know, good, good, good afternoon, students. And the, today, this is today's Tuesday. And these are today's announcements. And then I would just do, we do parodies on the teachers and we do imitations. I bring in other people. The last day of my senior year, I tried to go the entire class period. And finally, the principal came in and ripped the mic out of my hand. So, <laughs> so I think I became more bold and brazen the more I was exposed to humor and the more I did. And for me, it's been at bats. And it's like for all of us, the more you do, the, the better you hope you get. And I had a lot of opportunities uh, within the role of Groucho, which is an interactive role. And the show I just did, the show with Arthur Marx that he wrote, it's called Groucho, A Life in Review. That's the show I did in New York and London. That show's a biographical piece, and I played him from age 15 to 85. So it was very poignant. So here I was, 22, 23, essaying this, you know, huge existence, this big life. Now, as a 60-year-old, I just recently did the show again, almost, you know, 40 years later. It's very moving. Uh, the one-man show that Arthur discovered me in is much more freeform much more of a, of a review, much story. The, the premise being, what if Groucho had done a one-man show in his heyday and we all got to sit and watch him sing and 
and and do bits and play with us and, and improv. But, um, you know, I've been fortunate. I, I've been able to perform before Robin Williams and Pee Wee Herman and, and great comic entities have seen, uh, have, I've had in the audience, which was, you know, again, you know, extremely uh, nerve wracking, but also affirming, you know, and they've, and they've been very, I was lucky to meet some of my heroes who were supportive like that. These are the people that I really looked up to. People like Robin Williams, who was just so fast and furious. Yeah. I know. And, I think he said, Robin Williams said, you killed. Did he yeah. say that? Yeah. Yeah. And Sean Penn. Sean Penn said, you know, you were, uh, what are you, a giantly talented guy with uh, one foot in yesterday and one foot in today, something like that. Like yes, you owned it. Yes. I did my research. <laughs> you did. So I got to meet some really uh, remarkable, talented people. And, and when you're a freelancer, you're out of work a lot. And you don't know, when the, like, I don't know when the next big job is. And I've been doing this for 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get used to that as a freelancer. It never gets easier. George S. Kaufman, the great playwright and director who did so many great pieces, directed as wrote, like Man Who Came to Dinner and You Can't Take It With You. Even at the end of his life, he says it, ne it never gets easier. And I guess that's life you learn. It's, you can't expect it. But if you, the trade off is you get to do something you love to do. I've never felt I've worked, you know, the, yeah, I, I'm working, but I never feel like it was a chore or a job. It was always joy. And I still feel that way, but but I feel quite quite fortunate to be. I always feel like I'm one of those guys in the middle, a journeyman performer. I worked, you know, I've done thousands of performances. I've played all over, you know, all over the world. But you know, it's I'm not you know a household name, and I, I'm not Nathan Lane. But but I'm someone who's been fortunate enough to work a great deal and do. And, and I feel like my job is to keep at least to just get better at it and figure it out. And it's been more about, you know, from the time you're, you know, at 22, I did it because it felt good for me. It was good for my ego and my spirit. But now it's, I love certainly the, affecting the audience, getting, you know, knowing that someone is, you know, at 3 a.m. could watch PBS and my show might be on and they may be depressed and maybe they'll be elevated for a moment. That to me is really satisfying to hear from people that that's the power of, of, of television and, and the, you know, the internet yeah. uh, live is a hard thing. It's, you know, it's missionary work, you know, it's, it's 500 or a thousand people at a time. It's a whole different thing. And that's great. And that's special. It's ephemeral. And only those 500 or a thousand or 1200 people are going to experience that particular moment, of course. And then it's in the ethers. And um, that's kind of a, challenge to to live with as a stage guy i'm a live performer basically though i've done a few little tv film things but there's nothing like the hit of live performance and seeing people laugh or watching them be moved or engaged that mm -hmm. that goes back to the beginning of time when we all sat around the fire and there was one guy or gal who would tell the stories that would keep us from you know maybe keep us from uh looking at the the fear of, of our existence or the uh, the doubt and the unknown mel brooks is mel brooks's son i believe said that even his dad um was freaked out every time he made a film because he was also so concerned that it was going to be a failure even mel brooks yeah, suffered yeah. from that and if mel brooks suffers from that then i think you're probably allowed to suffer from it. <laughs> and if you want to, if if you want to take it even further, you know the whole movie, the producers, yeah. um, where there is that scene where the the play is on and they're in the bar, and they're wait. And this is what I was going to say: uh, they're in the bar waiting to hear the reaction, and then people start coming into the bar at the intermission or whatever, saying, "Geez, this play is really funny" or whatever. And um, I wanted to ask you. Because you, I was going to ask you uh, about what you get, you know, what the audience says about you. But I'm now because you just told us that I want to ask you, what do you? I mean, yes, they're in there. There's the 1,200 of them. It's over. They laugh. They go. They go home. But how gratifying is it for you to hear what they say about you? What that their reactions? The fact that they're getting into you. I mean, that just must. That must be just such a great feeling. You know, I, I didn't take it seriously for a long time. I, I, I have a hard time 
because uh, you know social media allows for a lot of feedback for all of us. Yeah. And for many years, I didn't. It did, I don't think about it too much. But as I get older, it has meaning because I have in my tiny little world, Kevin. There, there are people that will travel to see that performance. You know, they'll travel a few hours or fly in, and that happened recently in Philadelphia, where people are coming from Seattle to Philadelphia, and I don't think too much about it. But lately, as I get older, it it's quite moving to realize that this has become a shared experience. People want to have one more opportunity to see this particular style. And what I do is kind of, is odd. It's not typical. It's a, it's very niche what I do, I think, this kind of humor. So that's, that's satisfying. But uh, it's, it's, it was interesting. I was a uh, closing night in Philadelphia at the Walnut Street Theater, which is an historic theater. Everyone's played there, Brando and the Barrymores and the Marx Brothers. And still, it's been running for 215 years. It's never been dark except for the pandemic. Uh, of, of late and the closing night on march 10th we had a sold out house a thousand people to see groucho life and review it like i can't believe people are still showing up to see a show about a dead comedian played by someone who's you know not in you know, robin williams like the fact that there's an audience with this to me is inc i'm incredulous when i think of it I, I find it really strange and wonderful but that day there was a a parade there was a fire off the freeway. Uh, there was a protest, Islamic protest. So half the audience doesn't work told them the house manager chief, we got to hold the curtain. We only have 300 people, you know, and I think we ended up with half a house. And that's the nature of the theater. You're, you're, you know, you're at the mercy of, of the gods, weather, it snows, you don't get a crowd. If there's a world series or a Super Bowl, forget it. So at, 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 after that last performance, I said, you know, I need to start working on TV and, and, and <laughs> streaming projects, I should say. And I really had that moment in March. So I got to I have to make a shift because, you know, 40 years is a long time to be at the mercy of it all. You know, and, and I remember the first time I, I worked in Kansas City in that dinner theater 40 years ago, the Royals were playing the uh, what was it? Um, maybe the Cardinals. It was the World Series. Right. Does that make sense? It was. Um, and people would bring in little TV sets, you know, back in the day in the <laughs> mid eighties, and they were watching television while I'm you know, up there, you know, waxing poetic about, you know, the death of my brother Chico. And I remember I did a line where but I'm playing old Groucho. I go, Chico, I go, Chico died today. That's, you know, Chico's the oldest Marx brother and Grou as Groucho, I'm going, Chico died today. And someone goes, yes, yes, yes. They're watching, <laughs> you know, the, the you know, the, Kansas City Royals just not going to run. So um, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff you're competing with. And it's, you know, there's so much that we're competing with now in the world. You know, it's 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 tough. People, you know, people don't want to go downtown, downtown anymore in big cities. That's why there are more matinee performances you'll see over the next years and months. You know, if you have an eight-show week, half of those shows will be matinee, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, because the, the theater-going audience is generally – older and no one wants to go downtown philadelphia or chicago or new york or san francisco or seattle or la at 11 o'clock at night coming home that's so right. that's a good there's a and, lot actually, so, and frank with that transition so having to and actually I, I actually pronounced chico chico so i yeah i didn't know that um but question for you so what did you do during the pandemic well after crying for a year and a half no <laughs> but i did a you know what was useful was that my partner, Dre Weber, and I edited some footage of my one-man show, An Evening with Groucho. Uh, and that was taped in 2017 at the Cincinnati Playhouse, a great playhouse in, in regional theater in, in the States. And um, we had four performances, three camera angles, so it had sat there for three years. But we're never going to do this. And she said to me, why don't I edit this for you and you can sell it as merch after your shows? And then she started editing. I said, no, this is going to wind up on PBS, I said. And she said, don't get, don't put that pressure on me. And Drea has directed my show on stage and she's directed the, um, ultimately, she directed the filmed version. So that's what we did. We put together this and produced this thing from scratch. It was just, you know, the, people use the word manifest, but I was determined to see this happen. And so I was able to find a distributor. I, I raised the money. 
it was, you know, and, um, and I hired someone to reach out to the PBS station. So the pandemic was about producing a television special, which is still running on PBS and will be for the next couple of years. But it rolled out two years ago this month. And I'm so proud of it. It's in 80% of the countries, but out of nothing and desperation and, you know, all, all of us lost our money. Anyone in the theater got wiped out because we didn't work for two years. That's right. And so whatever savings you had for most of us was depleted. And, you know, it hasn't quite come back. So when you do a show like this, it all of it adds to, you know, hopefully more interest in supporting arts and artists and creative yeah. types. And, hmm. and um, so that's what happened. You know, it, it doesn't change. You know, just you can't quit. You know, um, I, I became very close friends with Hal Holbrook at the end of his life. And he was a great inspiration for me. I saw him when I was in college when I was developing the Groucho show. I didn't know what a solo show was. Who the hell knows what that means when you're 19 years old? I'd seen a Groucho show. I saw Arthur's show in an early, in a nascent stage. But so I saw Hal Holbrook play Mark Twain mm. in his acclaimed, you know, one of the greatest actors of the last century in this acclaimed production. It was on television in the 60s. 20 million people saw it. He was still working until he was 92 years old. And um, we became friends. Years, you know, about like eight, nine years before he passed, he came to see me in a show around 2015. And my point is, what he said to me is, he said, keep it going, keep it going. And I know what he meant, because it's going to be like it is for any of us who, I don't have a, a lawyer or a manager or agents or a team. I'm the team. I'm the company manager. I book the flights. You know, I hire the people. I do the technical rehearsal. And Hal Holbrook understands what that means. He's played the tiniest towns and he's played like I have New York and London. And, but I played Paducah and Altoona and Dubuque. I play all these places. Right. And, you know, I like meeting people and I kind of, un I have an understanding of the, a different understanding of what goes on in the country because of all the travel I've done over the decades. Yeah. And I understand why we are where we are politically, because I've been in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and you name it. I get it. I see the desperation. You see the pain. You see it all. And you also meet people who are very similar in so many ways. So you, it's a fascinating exercise to tour with the show. And no, it's, uh, I think it's I think it's a wonderful experience. I mean, uh, I spent majority of my career just on the road going to places and and uh, talking to people while you're doing your job. And listen, man, you learn a lot from that. But yes, you do. learning a lot, I wanted to, I, I have to ask you as we come up to the end of our time, um, have you, after 40 years, adopted any of Groucho's traits? Yeah. I mean, are you, are you going to, what is, what's, what's the grocery store chain in, in Cal, Ralph's? Or I mean, are you, are you going into Ralph's and talking to the cashier like Groucho or are you? Putting on no. the cash. I mean, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's a funny idea. I like that idea. <laughs> but you know what I did learn from him, Kevin? It's, I mean, I, I love the idea. You know, we could use more of that, actually. I would love it if someone came loping through, you know, Pavilion Bonds Market and was doing Groucho. But, you know, I really did pick up his his love of, of wordplay. Yeah. You know, I love words. Um, I read a lot when I was a kid because I wanted to learn more about everything because... He was so witty and he, you know, a great artist can inspire you. And that's how I see him. He's one part of this. It's a, it's a great, it's a nice folk. It's a wonderful through line in my life, my, my involvement with that role, but it's led to other me as a director. I've directed a Pulitzer, a play that became a Pulitzer finalist. I, that thing happened because of Groucho. Wow. That's because great. I, you know, that's all, and it sounds like I'm this, I'm surprised by it. I, I never think it was bragging because I, he, yeah. I can't believe these wonderful things have happened, but I thank Groucho for it. So I ha I don't go around imitating Groucho at Ralph's Market in, in Pasadena, but I also, <laughs> I think I I realized how much he loved what he did. He he never quit like Hal Holbrook. He never, he only stopped when he could no longer stand and remember. But 92 years, that's a long time to be doing, a sh you know, he did the show for 63 years. Wow. Groucho that's didn't stop until he couldn't walk you know even then he was performing so i think i learned a lot about words wordplay appreciating literature and uh dedication he was really dedicated to what he did and i yeah. 
That's what well, I you feel. You sure are, Frank. I mean, Thank really, you. Frank. You've, I mean, you received a star on the um, Palm Springs. Was it Palm Springs uh, Walk of Stars? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. That, that was fun because it was a party more than anything because the Marks family was there and my family was there. And it was the first kind of little honor they had, they did a little ceremony they'd done since the pandemic. So people were outside finally. Nice. Uh, that was meaningful. And I got to represent, in a way, theater performers. And it was like, it was nice to have that kind of tip of the hat from Palm Springs. And I just felt I was representing because it, theater folk don't get it like, you know, others may. So that made me feel good. It's great. Well, I just, uh, I guess it's time to say um, I would never join a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> um, but we are, uh, we are very grateful that you've taken a half hour to join our club uh, today, Frank. And what a great conversation. And uh, we, ha we all grew up watching the Marx Brothers on Saturday morning, along right. with the Bowery Boys and all these other sort of things. And I mean, they still do resonate. And Thank goodness there's someone out there who's still making it resonate uh, for us. And thank you for spending uh, uh, your morning with us here on uh, Believe of the People. Thank you both for this, for spotlighting me. This has been a real treat, Kevin, yours. Hello, <laughs> I must be going. I figure you can't do well. I can't leave you with the last <laughs> round of line. Although I th I think more like, well, Rochester, but oh, that Rochester. was somebody else. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I love good. that, Benny. But then again, I love all the, again, another great persona. You know, it's all that specificity counts. So thank you both for your thank time. Thank you so much, Frank. We really appreciate your time. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, that was delightful. And it's funny the Marx Brothers will live on forever. And it's great that Frank is right there keeping it all current for us. So thanks. I know. I'm so glad. And I hope people, too, from this really kind of uh, revisit, if they haven't, the Marx mm -hmm. Brothers and Frank and what he's doing because, wow, if you see him on stage, which I'm going to see him live, I've seen oh. lots of clips, he is exactly like Groucho. Like, it's it's mind-blowing. And uh, I think he was also doing some voiceovers for SpongeBob. Anyways, he's a super talented guy. And so, we, yes. didn't ask, we didn't ask him our usual question, which is, why do you believe in people? But um, I think... I know. I think he. Uh, I think he. He kind of answered it all the way through. He did. Um, and uh, anyway, if you found this conversation inspiring and you believe in people, then uh, why don't you subscribe to our podcast? Believe in people. See you again next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.